and uh, studying the HSC, doing her exams, and then there's uh, Tony all the way from Bondi trying to come here on time, uh, you know, lugging roast lamb and pork and all this type of stuff as well on the way here. Uh, and of course, my beautiful wife for doing all she does and helping me and making me look good. Amen. God bless you, wonderful souls. Uh, amen. And uh, of course, my son, Elijah, uh, I give you uh, uh, also um, my praises for helping us out. Amen. Uh, uh, pray for him. He's actually at a, a year 11 retreat that goes for a number of days. Um, and uh, it's meant to be something that they're going to try to, you know, tap into their, their well-being. Uh, Josiah mentions that other couple of derogatory terms in relation to that, but um, it's good for them, amen, to touch their insides and know who they are. Praise the Lord, amen. But we got, I'm not going to waste too much time. We, let's, let's give God all the praise as pastor comes up to preach the word, amen. Bless you, pastor. Thank you, Sirs. What a tremendous uh, thing to be here in, in Enfield, in the West. It's been a blessing. I want to say thank you to Pastor Dean and Donna, good friends of ours for many, many years. My wife was saying on the way home last night, we had just a fantastic time just being with you guys. And what a blessing it was to be here last night and just, just fellowship with you guys was awesome. And I want to, want to believe that anybody that's given to the offering, God will bless you. Yes. Bless you. Double portion, blessing yes. on you. Uh, just a, a, a real hundredfold blessing so you'll know that you know that whatever God is challenging you to do in this life he's going to give you the resource he's going to give you the power he's going to give you his grace because he, he wants to help us amen God wants to help us the title of my sermon tonight is it's your will it's your will let's turn to Luke chapter 8 verse 26 I wrote this sermon uh, pretty much in my mind and just taking some notes on the way back from Fiji. I was in Fiji in June this year. Uh, Pastor TJ asked me to go over and do some revivals. I did a revival in Suva and then I got to spend two nights in Nandi on the way out, spent some time with the pastors there. And then on Wednesday night, on Wednesday morning, we went to the church with Pastor Greg and had about 70, 78 chairs and he, uh, he said, Pastor, I want to pray that God would fill all the chairs. I said, well, let's lay hands on the chairs. We'll, yes. we'll pray around the building. We'll get out, pray around the suburb. And so we did that. And so that night they had, we had probably 98 people come, more than chairs, and it was packed. And, but what had happened was in the revival in Suva, I, I challenged people to believe for miracles and people came up and they wrote their miracles down. There's a young Indian man who came to me and he said, listen, Pastor, there's, um, there's someone specific that I want to pray for. She's a friend of mine from Bath and uh, my family knows her family and she gave her life to Jesus four years ago. She got radically saved, transformed, set free from uh, Hinduism and she was coming to church for about a year in Bath. She would come to the services uh, sort of rally services in Nandi and even in Suva and got to be known. And then after about a year, she, she really just backslid. But not only did she backslid, she would say to many, many people in the Suva church, friends and Nandi and in Bar Church, Jesus doesn't love me. God, God doesn't love me. Uh, God can't help me. Uh, she had an eat, eating disorder where she was losing weight and felt that every time that she would eat, she would feel like she was being choked. This guy was telling me about this stuff and he said, Pastor, I want to pray that she's been backslidden for three years and I really want her to get saved. I want God to touch her and bring her out and show her that he, that he loves her, that he really does. Oh, I know Jesus loves her. And I said, okay, man. So we just sort of prayed. We just said that two or three agreed together. We prayed. I'd forgotten about it. Six, six days later, I'm in Nandy, preached the service and right probably near the start of the song service, this girl comes in with three of her friends and they sort of carry her in. She's a bit emaciated. She's probably about less than 50 kilos, 29. She sort of, they sit there and at the end of the service, pull people up for salvation. Ten people come to the front. They get saved and people get healed and there's stuff going on. And then she says, she sort of comes over and gets my attention. She says, I'm the girl that you prayed for. And I said, do you want to give your life to Jesus? And it was a bit of a scene, but I'm going to sort of cut it down for you. So I said to her, you want to give your life to Jesus? She said, yes. As soon as she grabbed my hands, she started jumping off the ground. She started jumping off the ground, at least a metre off the ground. And she's ah, like this, and it's someone else is talking. Her, her, her life is demon-possessed. And then all of a sudden, 
She threw herself back and knocked the whole front row flying. People sort of jumped back. The place is packed. And as she's manifesting, I just said to the demon, shut up in Jesus' name, put her on the chair. She sat on the chair and we prayed for an old lady who was a Hindu old lady who, who her hands had been twisted, her feet had been twisted. She could hardly walk. And she came to the front and said, I need to be healed. And I said, okay, let's sit her in the chair. And I said to this girl, you watch, God's going to heal her because Jesus loves us. And as she's watching, I spoke to this lady. I said, "Um, are you a Christian? She said, no. My friends over here, four different ladies from the church, they bought me. I'm a Hindu. I've been a Hindu. I was born a Hindu. But they told me if I believe in Jesus, Jesus would heal me. I'm gonna, the doctor said, I'm really sick, I'm going to die. And I said, okay, well, let's pray, let's believe. And I, I grabbed her feet, just like I, I grabbed the feet, and I grabbed her feet and they were so apart and so twisted that I couldn't even get them like this close to each other. They were so bad. And she's sort of like in the chair. And uh, as I'm praying for her, I see some really disturbing scenes in her family. And I said to her, um, your husband, um, he's not a very nice man. And she said, no, pastor, he's not. She became animated. She, she spoke very clear, almost Queen's English. And uh, she's not. I hate him with all that is in me. She's like this. I'm like, sure, my goodness me. And then I said, okay, right. Oh, well, um, so, but you want Jesus to heal you, right? And she said, yes, I do. I was like, I stand up and... I grabbed her hands and I looked at her and I said, "Um, do you believe that Jesus loves you? And she said, yeah, I heard you preach and I I think yes. I heard you share, share, yes, I think yes. Do you believe he can heal you? And she's all like this. She says, I think so. I said, I believe he can heal you totally. And then she looked at me and I said, okay, let's pray. And so she starts to pray and she says, Jesus, and I just lead her through a simple prayer. And then I said, I would forgive all those who have sinned against me and hurt me. And she looked at me. She opened her eyes. She looked at me. She says, no, pastor. And she's like this. And I said, why not? And she said, because my husband deserves me to hate him for eternity. Because he's been so evil and so bad to me. He deserves my judgment on his life. And I was like, gee, whoop. That's like full on, man. And she was animated. She was adamant. This is, my judgment's going to be on this guy because he's such an evil man. And I was like, well, I just, I closed my eyes, I grabbed her hands and said, Lord, you're going to have to help me here. This is, <laughs> this is way, way, way beyond me. And so I looked at her and I said, um, and I just like, Poof, this thought just came. And I said, what, do you believe that Jesus controls all the universe? And she said, Yes. I said, do you believe that Jesus controls the angels and the demons? And she said, yes. I said, what if we pray, if I pray with you right now, we forgive your husband and everyone who's hurt you, but we pray, I pray for you right now that as you leave, Jesus is going to send an angel to protect you and the next time that your husband comes and tries to beat you, the angel is going to pick him up and throw him against the wall and smash him into the wall and show him that Jesus has power over your life and his life. She goes, can he do that? (laughs) And I said, why not? Let's believe, right? And she's like this, she's like this. And she literally goes, okay. As she says, okay, her whole, her whole, her hands come loose. She totally comes loose like this. She looks at me and goes, what? I said, Jesus sets us free. I said, sit back in the chair for me. Her, her legs are a little bit closer. <laughs> and I said, let's forgive your husband for everything he's ever done to you. She says, okay. So she starts to pray with me. She looks at me and she says, I want to live for Jesus. I can tell that God is a good God. I don't want to be a Hindu anymore. This is, that's nonsense. That idol worship, it's nonsense. I, I, I can feel that. And I said, okay. So I got her up. We started walking. Her legs sort of started to straighten as she's walking. Back and forth, back and forth. Three times she ran from one side to the other and she came back and she said, Pastor, I feel like a little girl. I feel like a young girl. I said, how old are you? She said, I'm over 80. 
And I've been carrying this for the last 20 odd years of my life. And she was free. And so she sat down. I was like, let's give God a clap offering. We worship God, you know. And I turned to the other lady and I said, what do you think about that? You think Jesus loves her? I think she thinks Jesus loves her. What do you think? And I was like, oh, okay. Anyway, so I call her up and the pastors are there. We start to pray. I know this is a bit of a long story, but I want you to think with me about the will. Because this lady's will was dead set against forgiveness. But she surrendered and received a miracle. This lady's there and we're praying and I'm saying to her, do you believe that God is good? She says, yes, but not to me. Do you believe God can set you free? No. Do you believe that he can heal you of this sickness that's killing you? You, you, There's a sickness killing you. It's like choking you. She said, yes, it's choking me to death and I need Jesus to heal me. Why isn't he healing you? She said, I don't know. I don't think he likes me. I don't think he loves me. I think he's against me. I said, okay, give me your hand. As I took her hand, the evil spirit started to speak. I said, shut up in Jesus' name. Just like that. She looked at me and I said to her, when you're a little girl, you went to the temple with your parents. You were six years old. And the priest, the guru priest, he prayed something over your life. What did he pray? She said, no, 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 no. I said, don't lie to me. She said, yes, it's true, I was there and I stood at the front and he prayed in a language that I didn't know. I said, what's the temple name? She said, it's Shiva, Shiva's temple. Shiva's the God of destruction. He's the God of death. He's Satan, that's who he is. And so she says, we're there and he started to pray and chant and then he got a bowl and he put some honey in it and he stirred it around, put some 24 karat gold in it, wiped it all over my tongue gave me a charm and put it in my mouth. And I said, really? She said, yes. I said, have you ever repented of that? She said, no. Should I have? And I said, yes, you should have. That's why, that's why you feel that God can't love you. There's, some, there's something holding you bondage. There's something holding you in bondage. And she said, yeah, but I want to be free. I said, do you really want to be free? She says, I want to be free. I said, okay, well, pray with me. And as she started to pray with me, it started to manifest again. It's like it was totally controlling her thoughts, controlling her mind. She didn't even know. And then I told the demon to shut up. I talked to her and I said, do you realize that you're possessed? She said, no, I'm not possessed. She started to argue with me. And I went, my goodness me, what is happening here? It's like I'm arguing with myself here. I said, give me your hand. And I said, God, what is wrong with this woman? And the Holy Spirit said to me, she's given her whole life to a fantasy. Listen to me. How many people give their life to a fantasy? She's given her whole life to a fantasy. And I said, do you believe in fantasies? She said, no, no, no. I said, look at me. Do you play fantasy games? No. Do you have some fantasy book? No. Do you have any fantasy that you believe in? No, no, no. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, ask her, who is Shiva's wife? I said, who is Shiva's wife? Who's his girlfriend? Who is Shiva married to? She's like this. Her tongue starts to come out of the mouth really long. And then she says, Shakti, Shakti, Shakti. And I said, that's what it is. You believe that that guy's cursed you and you believe that you're Shakti and that you have special powers to control your life and other people's lives. You believe that, don't you? And she looked at me and went, yes. I said, you can't do that and live for Jesus. You need to repent of that and you'll be free. She said, okay. So she prayed with me. As soon as she prayed with me, she ran through the toilet, vomited, vomited up. That thing had been in her since she's six years old. She's 29, 23 years. Why do I tell you that story? Because listen to me, the title of the sermon is It's Your Will. You get to choose, right? I want to ask you a question before I read the text. Who is the most powerful in all the universe? And it's not a trick question. Who is it? Tell me. God, right? So Jesus is God in the flesh. Yes, we agree? So he's the most powerful, right? God is the most powerful. Who's number two on the pecking order? 
according to the word of God. Who's number two? Who? It's man. Many people say to me, it's the devil. It's not the devil. It's not demons. It's not angels. It's not principalities and powers. It's man. Man is the one who willfully threw the whole earth into sin and bondage. So your will is the second most powerful thing in all the universe. Listen to me. The most powerful thing that you possess is your will. It's the most powerful thing that you'll ever pray with, ever think about, and ever do. Last night I preached on the heart. What does the Bible say about the heart? It's deceitful, wicked, yes. All the things that we can change, yes. But Jesus says, even if your heart fails you, I will not fail you. How is that possible? Because you can willfully worship Jesus when you're in turmoil. You can willfully worship him in sorrow. You can willfully cry out to him in any moment when your heart fails you because your will is engaged. God gives you power in your will. Let's read our text. Luke 8. Here's the demon-possessed man healed. It says, Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, this is Jesus stepping out onto the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. He must have been a bit of a sight, this guy. It says, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had com- uh, commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Listen, the man comes, he submits to Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus has already commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, but he hasn't come out. For it had often seized him and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, looking straight at him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him, Jesus, that he would not command them to go out into the abyss, out into out of darkness. Now a herd of many swine or pigs was feeding there on the mountain. We know that the Jews shouldn't be near pigs, but they were. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, the swine, the demons out of the man into the swine. And he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. And when those who fed them saw, so the people who tended the pigs saw what had happened, they fled and told it to the city in the country. And they went out to see, the whole, the whole city's come out to see what's happened. And they came to Jesus and they found this demon-possessed man from whom the demons had departed, sitting there at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. That's a miracle, right? Yes. But what does the Bible say? They looked at that and rather than rejoicing and thanking God, they're afraid. Why are they afraid? Because they understand by their will they're doing the wrong thing. They also, who had seen it, told them by what means he, had, uh, he who had the demon possessed was healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them. Here's the Son of Man, God in the flesh. They're telling him to leave. For they were seized with great fear. This is a demonic strategy of hell. This is what this girl said to me. I've been controlled by fear that God does not love me and he rejects me. This is what the devil does. And he got into the boat and returned. This is Jesus, but look what happens to the man. Now the man from whom the demon had departed begged him that he might uh, be with him, Jesus. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your own house. This is in the city of the Gadarenes and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus 
had done for him. You know, a lot of historians say that revival broke out in 10 cities around this whole area of Decapolis because of this man who was demon-possessed over the next 200 years. That's a powerful deliverance. That's a powerful setting free. When his will lined up with the will of God, he's influencing 10 cities, influencing his brethren, his family, who knew that they weren't right with God. It's clear they're afraid. I met a man when I was in Bankstown. His name's Roy Henry Paul. He's a Maori man. What happened was I got invited to go to his house and pray for his stepdaughter, a lady who's in the paramedic church, Anna. And when I was there, they were telling me that Roy had had a really bad heart condition and the doctors had given him weeks to live. But Roy has been drinking alcohol since he was about 10 or 12 years old. He's almost 70. And the doctors said that they couldn't operate on his heart because he was such a bad alcoholic. He drank alcohol every day. And they're sort of telling me this and I'm just like, oh yeah, okay. So let's pray for him. So we just prayed for him in the kitchen. I didn't know Roy was actually in the house. He's down the hallway couple of rooms away. He must have heard us praying for him, I'm, I'm thinking. So what happens is the ladies sort of go out the back door. They were looking at some clothes and some stuff out the back and I'm just sitting there having a cup of tea and I hear movement in the hall and it's, it's pitch black. I'm in this small kitchen in the light and the hall is so dark I can't see anybody or nothing and I hear something, someone moving and some muttering in the hall. I'm looking, I'm thinking it's a demon. I'm like, Oh no, I'm starting to, oh man, what's going on? I'm in this house, I don't really know the house. And I'm sort of looking like this into the darkness. And then all of a sudden this voice comes out of the darkness and says, you must be the pastor. And I said, who's that? And he sort of comes out sort of into the light a little bit, almost like half into the light, like a cockroach, you know, like the cockroaches, sort of half into the light, half into the dark. He's like this. And he's got, all he's got on is a pair of boxer shorts and that's it, nothing else. No shoes, nothing. He's got a pair of boxer shorts and he's holding a long neck of VB. And he's, he looks at me and he goes, you must be the pastor. I'm, I'm Roy. And I went, okay, Roy, how are you? I've heard about you. And he said, I've heard about you. And I said, and what have you heard about me, Roy? And he said, I've heard that I need to repent of my sins and give my life to Jesus so that God can heal my heart. That's what they've been telling me, that you're going to tell me. <laughs> and I said, Roy, I'm not sure if that's what I'm going to tell you. What do you, what do you want from God? And he's, he's got his alcohol like this and he goes, puts it behind his back like that. <laughs> and he says to me, he says, well, I want God to heal my heart. But I know that they won't operate on me because I'm a bad drinker. And he said, I've tried to give up drink, but I just can't do it. I can't give it up. Every time I try and give up, I get the shakes. And He said, I can't give it up. So I really want strength and power to be able to overcome my alcohol, I suppose. But I'm not sure if I want Jesus. I don't know. I thought, you know what, Roy? That's honest, man. We can work with that, bro. So I got up and laid hands on him and started to pray for him. Did he get saved? No. No, he didn't. Not then. I want to think with you about the will of a man. What am I saying? Am I, am I telling you that you could be demon-possessed like the Gadarean? Listen to me. I met a lot of people and the devil is absolutely demon-possessing people. Yes. But not everyone's demon-possessed. A lot of people are demon-oppressed where the demons are on the outside tormenting their life. Different words that they hear, soothsaying words, evil words, the words of people. So you think about this. At this point, this man is demon-possessed. He has all the excuses in the world to stop him from living for Jesus. He's got a legion of demons living in his life. He's cursed by sin. He's cursed by the sins of his forefathers. 
everybody's been chaining him up, rejecting him. I thought to myself, imagine this man being abused by the people in these cities. Because he's so evilly twisted, the Bible says that they chained him with chains and ropes against his will. I don't know about you, but I think that would be a fairly scary event. Being chased. Imagine being chased through the night. The guy's too possessed. Being chased by a herd of people to be chained and bound. I think this guy had some problems. What do you think? Just a few little mental problems. Think about the problems that this guy had. See, Paul doesn't sugarcoat this for us in Galatians 5 when he points out the problems of sin. He says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Why do I read this? Because the works of the flesh are your will. That's what activates the flesh is your will. Adultery, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder. He goes on and on, drunkenness, revelries. I read this out to to my friend Roy and he goes, oh, pastor, I know I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. (laughs) It was a funny, funny, funny scene because then he had to put his his long neck down (laughs) because he was so shaken about how bad he was. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what I said to Roy. Roy, it's not about God healing your heart. It's not about God taking away the alcohol. It's about you wanting to live for Jesus and making eternity your home. And he started to cry, softened his heart, big Maori guy. At first, I thought he was going to attack me in the hallway. It was a bit scary. I want to think with you about the will of a man or the will of a woman. What does this word will, what does it mean? How does it translate? It means to cause or to change by an act of human mental force with the physical will. So in other words, in here in your mind and in your heart, you consider things and then you physically do them or you say words that set you on a course by your will. It's like your will activates the thoughts. Your will activates the intentions. Your will activates the purpose. This word intent is linked to will. This word purpose, it's talking about to change the present or the future by purpose. This is what will means. It means I want to change something about the future by the way I view myself and the way I view others and what I say. This takes planning. It takes focus to change the outcome of the future, either for good or bad, right? Because people, they set their will to do bad, don't they? That's why people worship the devil, don't they? People worship themselves. People worship idols. People worship many things by their will, setting in in action bad things. It means to decree. It's almost like I decree my future and set my will by my words. That's why I preached last night about the heart because what comes out of your mouth will seal your will or steer your will. It's interesting. We want to be good and do what Jesus wants us to do, right? But we constantly pull ourselves down. We constantly say, I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. You know what? Roy used to say that a lot when I first met him. It means to ordain. The providence of God's will is to be set in motion. It means to determine by the act of a human will the choice of clear understanding. This gives the picture of something that happens in the moment. So in other words, something happens in the moment, but I've already purposed in my mind and in my heart to set my will. This is Jesus going to the cross, right? Because he says to the Father, not my will, but your will be done. So it's like Jesus knowing the flesh. He says, Father, I need your will to empower my will to go to the cross. So he sets that in motion in the garden 
so that nothing from that moment can change his will. How do I know this? Because Jesus had to be tempted in all the things we're tempted in. Why did Jesus say, Father, why have you forsaken me? Do you think that God didn't forsake him at that moment? He had to. But it was his will set by the will of his Father that took him to the cross so that he could at that moment bear the fullness of our sin, the fullness of our destruction, the fullness of the power of sin, death and hell. So at that moment, he was 100% man. Had to be. Because the Bible says he had to be the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice to set us free from sin, death and hell. Think about that. It's like God is showing us that Jesus set his will so that it, he's knee-jerk. He's knee-jerk when he was being flogged. He's knee-jerk when they were ridiculing him. His knee-jerk was, that's irrelevant. I'm going to the cross. What you're saying to me is irrelevant. What you're doing to me is irrelevant because I'm on a mission. I've set my will. This is what will means, to intend, to purpose. It's interesting because I was praying about this. I said, God, that's, that's like amazing understanding, but how does that translate to me, <laughs> to, to what I'm doing right now? It's interesting because it actually, it links to the disposal of somebody's bequeathed will. So after you die, your will can influence the living that's how powerful a will is. Think about that. You know, many people put in, uh, and I've been talking to my accountant about this, about trusts and what they mean. So a trust can put in place for between 150 and 200 years what somebody wants to happen with their money and their finances and everything they've done in life after they're dead. So they can influence their whole family for up to 200 years after they die. Do you think a will is powerful? Think about that. There's evil people who pray to the dead that the dead's will would influence the living. I know this is true because I've seen it before I was saved. And I wondered, what is this power? It's the will of man. That's what it is. It's the will of men that gets set in motion. Think about that. How many times have you seen someone, they die, and then everybody fights over their estate? But the will, pretty much, boom, whatever the will is, doesn't matter what they're fighting about. Doesn't matter what they say. The will is, it's set. To exercise power over the living by the dead person. To choose to do your will. You know, it's interesting because the Satanic Bible has one one commandment, and that is do whatever you will, be the whole of the law, right? Do whatever you want to do with your life. Do whatever you want to do in your will. Empower your will to do whatever you want. That's why this, that's why this girl believed that Jesus didn't love her because in her will, she was shakti. She couldn't be loved by Jesus. She'd made herself her own idol. She'd made herself a channel of hell. That's serious. But yet, crying out to Jesus and asking God for help, and the devil was mocking her. In verse 27 it says, And when he stepped out onto the land, Jesus, the demon-possessed man, who had the legions of demons living in him, he chose to come to Jesus willfully by his will receiving the forgiveness and the healing of his spiritual curses and every bad choice that he'd made. This word legion, I looked it up. It's actually from the Roman legions. That's where it comes from originally. And at this particular point in time, it didn't mean a thousand. It actually meant between four and six thousand soldiers. This time in history, because the legions had been around for hundreds of years. And the particular legion that was in Jerusalem at this time was more than 4,000 men. And there were some legions in that region that were 6,000 men. 
So think about that. Let's just say, and I'm going to call him, you know, just so I don't have to keep saying his whole name, I'm going to call him the Gatto, right? So let's just say our friend the Gatto had 4,000 demons living inside him, just a minimum of a legion. I don't know about you, but that's 4,000 problems, isn't it? That's 4,000 mental issues. That's 4,000 excuses. That's 4,000. Imagine, imagine having 4,000 personalities. Woo! My goodness me, how would I deal with that? But here he is, instantly. The power of his will has power over all the forces of hell, all the forces of Satan, and is able to be touched by Jesus and delivered in an instant. That's the power of a will, right? See, sometimes we find ourselves in a place where we're under attack. We're under assault. And God wants us to realign our will with his will. What do you think? What are you, what are you doing about allowing Jesus to step into every area of your life and empower your will? Because a lot of times we don't even think about this. We don't even think about what our heart is doing and what our will is doing. We don't think about that. We just, it's almost like we just knee-jerk react to the moment and then get disappointed with ourselves because we say and do things we shouldn't do. Right? But listen to me. If we set our will before the turmoil, you'll be surprised what happens. My pastor preached some great sermons on Jesus setting his will to the cross. And I remember many times praying, four or five times over the last 20 years, God, set my will. Set my will to be a man of God. Set my will to be a good husband. Set my will to be a good father. Set my will to be a good friend. Because listen, if you don't set your will, what happens is you have all these turmoil and thoughts. And they say things like, who are you, you loser? You ever heard your thoughts speak back to you and call you a loser? Just me. He's crazy. Listen, I know that our thoughts speak to us and call you. Sometimes your flesh doesn't like it when you set your will. Your flesh can say things to you. Amen. Sometimes your flesh can say things like, you're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. You're unclean. Amen. It'll say things like, I can't do it. It's too hard to live for Jesus. It'll say things like, I just don't want to do it. And I don't want to, and I won't. You never said that? It's interesting how a little kid can say that, right? You don't teach him this stuff, and then you say, don't touch that. And they go, hmm? don't touch that. Really? And then it'll get a smack. It's like, don't, t- don't touch that. So they willfully want to do what they're told not to do. It's almost, it's almost like they know trouble's coming, but their will just, I have to do it because you said no. What is that? This is horrible. See, we need to let God touch our will and clean our life. We want to have a look at the will of Jesus as our saviour. See, Roy was a sinner. He said to me, Pastor, if I take responsibility for all those evil things that you said that I am, which I am, could God save me? Could God heal my heart? And could God let me go to heaven even though I've been an evil man my whole life? I said, yes, Roy. He said, okay, let's do it then. Standing there in his boxes. And so what happened was he got powerfully saved. Roy got powerfully saved. He went to hospital the next week. He hadn't drank for a week, didn't have the DTs, went to hospital. I went and prayed for him in hospital a couple of times. He had open heart surgery, bypass surgery, and God healed him and he came back out. But because Roy had damaged himself for so many years, about six months, he'd been coming to church, he's standing in the back, he started to lift his hands. He came the first service that he came to, he lifted his hands and he he sang Amazing Grace and the guy had a voice, man. Amazing grace, he's just singing it like, and the whole church just stopped worshipping God and turned around and watched him. And he's just got his hands up, lifting his hands and singing amazing grace to Jesus. And relatives of his started to cry and said, that's impossible. Roy Henry Paul worshipping Jesus? 
That's not that we don't know. We've never we've never known this man, but we've known him our whole life. See, because when your will surrenders to the will of God, it changes who you are. I want to give you a couple of verses that you should pray over your life. Second Corinthians thirteen five. Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he should be in you. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are you in the Son of God? And is he in you? Because that, that's a willful thing. You have to willfully want him in. You have to willfully ask him to come in. Ephesians 3 verse 14 says, For this reason I bow my knee to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. This is your will. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounding in love would live for Jesus. Lastly, I want to have a look at the will of God. Just before COVID hit, we were on the streets and I'd been, uh, Roy had been asking me, what about, what's this stuff on the calendar about outreach, Pastor? He'd been coming to church for almost two years. <laughs> he just had no clue. He just, and he used to say to me after every service, can't we worship God more, Pastor? Can't, three songs is good, but can't we do six? <laughs> And I'd say, why? And he'd go, because I just love worshipping Jesus. Amen. I love to worship God. It's like when I worship God, it's like I feel him come in and touch my soul. He, in that period, he'd lost a kidney, ended up in, in hospital, said he's going to die, he's not going to come out. We prayed for him, he came back to the life. He got cancer in his liver. They had to cut half his liver out. Went into hospital again. They said he's going to die. He, he resurrected again. Went and prayed for him again. So over that two years, he, he had like three life-threatening times in hospital. But because God was with him, he got healed. We're on the streets. We're worshipping God on the streets. We're street preaching on the streets. And I hear a commotion across the road. It's in Bankstown. It's out the front of the Commonwealth Bank. And here's Roy. He's got his beanie on. It's in the winter. He's got, he's got like this big jacket on and he's running up and down in front of, he's, he's nearly 70, he's running up in the front of, of, the, of the Commonwealth Bank and he's dancing. He's dancing like this and he's yelling out, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. He's watched a street preach. He's got off the bus and he's running up and down going, Jesus is real. Everything Pastor Corey said about Jesus, it's all real. Everything Danny said, it's all real. He doesn't even know what he's doing. He's just dancing, going, Yahoo! Jesus is real, let me tell you. And I'm watching this. He did this for about 10 minutes. And I thought, far out, man, this guy's saved. Yes. This guy's set free. Not only that, I didn't even teach him to street preach. And he's just there, he's watching, going, Yeah, I'm into that. Whatever they say, I've got a clue what I'm doing. Amen. See, there's no room for sin in your life when you do the will of God. Romans 8 verse 10, it says, If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but your spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Verse 35 of our text says, and then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed in his right mind and they were afraid. See, God knows where you need to live and he has a specific time and place for your life. But you willfully need to follow his destiny and will for your life. God's destiny for you is linked to this church. It's linked to your pastor and his life. It's linked to the calling of Pastor Wayne Mitchell upon his life and Pastor Greg Mitchell and what God is doing in our fellowship. I'm not saying our fellowship's the only fellowship, but listen to me. The day I went to church, I'd been saying, God, why was I born? The Holy Ghost woke me up. I was drunk. And the voice of God said to me, 
You want to know what I'm doing in all the world, Corey? You want to know why you were, why you were born? Get up and go to the potter's house and I'll show you. Listen, no other church would have taken me in. <laughs> That's a reality. And I said that to Roy. I said, Roy, at the potter's house, we take people like you. We love you, Roy. And we let you grow. Will you go fully into the will of God and trust him with a loyal heart to do the mission of your king? Will you share this, the great things that God has done in your life? Because that's what Jesus told the demoniac to do. Go and share what great things I've done in your life with everybody you know. I want to finish here. So Roy ended up in hospital in COVID because of his kidney. He had to have continual blood transfusions. But he was scared to go to hospital because of COVID. He didn't do the blood transfusions. He didn't do the cleaning of his kidneys. And after about six or eight months, he got really sick. He went to the toilet and he fainted and the ambulance came and took him to intensive care. And he was in intensive care in Liverpool and I got a phone call to go and see him. And you could only go in two at a time. And so we went in and as I went in there, he's got his beanie on. He sits up and goes, Pastor, I've been waiting for you. Where have you been? He goes... I was trying to get you to come to the house, but uh, you've been busy and I was busy and, you know, so, and they wouldn't let us do that anyway, the idiots, and he's like this, and the nurse is there. And, and then the nurse goes, oh, I'll go, and he goes, yeah, you're good. And so he, he said to me, he said, Pastor, I need a miracle. I said, what, Roy? He goes, yeah, I'm not ready to go yet. He said, Jesus wants me to do some things first. Amen. I said, what does he want you to do, Roy? He goes, well, we'll talk about that, but first of all, I need you to pray for a miracle. And I said, really? He goes, yeah, I want you to pray that Jesus is going to resurrect me from the dead like he did the last three times. And I went, okay, right, let's do that. So we start to pray. We're praying, you know, and I pray for him. And, and the Holy Spirit says to me, Roy's not going to get out of the bed. And Roy's like excited. He's got a big smile on his face. And he's like, no worries, Pastor. I'll be up and out of here in two weeks. I just need a little bit of a rest and I'll be back on track. And I said, well, what are you going to do? And he goes, I want to go and tell my whole family about Jesus. I didn't tell them all. I've told some of them, but not all of them. And he said, and besides that, when I came in here last night, God told me that I haven't said sorry to the people that I've hurt. I haven't said sorry. I haven't looked him in the eye and said, I'm sorry for being evil. I'm sorry for being an evil man. I'm sorry for what I've done to you. I've robbed you of life. I've robbed you of God's goodness. And I'm sorry. I said, Roy, what about I invite all your relatives to come and see you and you talk to them? Because what if this is it? What if this is your time to go and be with Jesus, Roy? And he looked at me and goes, don't say that, Pastor. You're the miracle man. I said, no, Jesus is the miracle man, Roy. He goes, yeah, but you always believe. I said, I do. But what if this is it? What if this is your time to step into eternity, Roy? He looked at me and he goes, well, I'm not ready to go yet, Pastor. I said, why? And he goes, because I've got to say sorry. I said, I'm going to get the whole family. So the next day the whole family came up. They all went in one by one and Roy got to say sorry to all of them. Every single one. Got to say sorry to this friend and that friend and this one and that one. Tell him that he loved him. I went in and saw him. And he said to me, he goes, Pastor, I'm still not going. You know that, don't you? And I said, okay, Roy. He said, but I want, to make, I, want, I want you to make me a promise. I said, what is it, Roy? He said, you need to promise me one day you'll go to Gisborne and you'll preach to my whole family, my whole tribe. I said, okay, Roy, I promise. I said, you've got to make me a promise, Roy. He said, what is it? I said, when you get to heaven, tell Jesus I need more help in Bankstown. He goes, Pastor, I've got you covered. I went, I was supposed to go and see him the next day at five o'clock. I got a phone call at 3, 3.45. He's, um, the, the lady he was going to marry, he said sorry that he didn't marry her. Uh, he wanted to actually marry her. She was there with her sister and th these guys have been together since they were five years old in school. She's a nurse, her name's Ma. She's on the phone and she says, Pastor Roy just passed into eternity, he's just going to be with Jesus. And I said, Ma, what happened? She said, Pastor, you're not going to believe it. She said, I've seen hundreds of people die. She said, he sat up and he looked at Tyner and he said, Tyner, I'm sorry, I love you. You've, you've been the love of my life. I'm sorry I never married you. I'm sorry that the alcohol destroyed me and here I am and I'm going to be with Jesus, I think, soon, maybe. <laughs> and uh, so they're talking like this and she's saying sorry and they're sort of like this and 
And then Ma turns to uh, Tyner and says, tell Roy it's time to go and be with Jesus. And he starts to labour. The big guy's chest is labouring. His heart's about to give up. She looks at him and says, it's time to go and be with Jesus, Roy. And he goes, okay, let's do that then. And he literally folded his arms, looked both of them in the eye with a massive smile on his face. She said, as he leant back before he hit the pillow, he was gone. She said, I looked over because you're supposed to close their eyes and straighten their face up. He said, she said, I looked over and tried to close his eyes and I couldn't close his eyes. I looked over and tried to then, you know, mess with his face. I couldn't get the smile off his face, Pastor. It's amazing. I, I've tried like for more than 15 minutes and I can't get the smile off his face. I said, really? We organised the funeral. They did an open casket. I got to preach online three services to everybody in Gisborne give the testimony and challenge them. They got saved. 36 of them prayed sinners' prayers. But the freaky thing was, when I first got to the funeral, Ma comes up to me and says, Pastor, you've got to come and have a look at this. And I went, what? She said, well, you know how half the Maori family wanted the casket open and half didn't? And Roy said, I couldn't care, whatever they want. He said, don't let them put... He told Toby, he said to me, don't let them put any Maori stuff on me, Pastor, because I'm not a Maori no more. I'm born again. Tell them. And I said, you sure, Roy? He goes, I want you to tell them all. I told you that. I said, okay, no worries, no worries, Roy. So I'm walking down the front and they tried to put some stuff on the coffin. And he told Ma and Ma came and just took it and threw it off to the side like this. And they're all looking at her. She's a little lady, right? They're all looking at her. And I said, hey, 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 that's what Roy said. She looked at me and she goes, oh, Pastor. She goes, look, look at him. She brings me over and here he is. He's sitting, he's like, he's like it's, like he's, it's almost like his teeth. It's like smiling like this and his eyes are just like he's alive. And I'm like, wow, he looks like he's still alive. She goes, Pastor, that's how he died. Just like that. And she said, I wish, I hope that I die with heaven on my face like that. You know what he said to me, last thing he said? He said, tell them all, Pastor. I went to heaven because I wanted to love Jesus. And Jesus loved me. Let's bow our heads. That's the will. That's the will. I know I've preached a bit long. But listen to me. Your will is very, very important. Listen to me. The devil doesn't care about too much that you do. But he cares what you put your mind and your will to. He cares what you set your heart to do, what you set your will to do. That's why the devil tried to stop Jesus from going to the cross. That's why the devil is trying to stop your pastor and his wife and you building the kingdom of God here. Because he's trying to come against your will, the will of God for your life. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ. Listen, you can't fight against sin, death and hell unless you're saved. You can't fight against the flesh unless you've repented of your sins and given your life to Jesus and set your will to be saved. Maybe you're here, maybe you're backslidden, maybe you don't know Jesus, you'd raise your hand and say, yes, pastor, that's me. Amen. I believe we're all saved tonight, but listen to me. I know that the devil assaults our will and he tries to discourage us and he tries to rob us of vision. He tries to rob us of destiny. He tries to rob us of being obedient to the will of God for our life. And the way he does it is he assaults our will. Just little bit by little bit. Tantrum by tantrum. Outburst by outburst. Disappointment by disappointment. Whatever it is. I want to challenge us to come to the front. And I want you to surrender your will to the will of God. These orders are open. Come to the front. Spend some time in the presence of God. Please come to the front. Spend some time. Lord, we pray right now. Your dominion, your victory, your liberty. Shanda batachas. Please come out of your seat. Come to the front. Please come. Come. Don't stay in your seat. Come. Come and spend some time. Either come and sit on the front row or come and come, come to the altar. Shanda rebebebebe. Lord, we pray, God, strengthen our will in Jesus' name. Go right now. Touch us. Touch us with the will of God. Touch us, my God, with your grace and your mercy. Touch us, God, right now with your will. Strengthen our will, Lord God. Strengthen our will, Lord Jesus. Strengthen our will, Lord God. Touch us. 
Shandaba Siki, the will of God sets us free. Shandaba Siki, Araba Sando Redebebebe. Touch us with your will, Lord God. Touch us, Jesus. Touch us, Jesus. Shandaba Siki, set us free, Lord God. Your will, your dominion. Shandabu Siki, Araba Sandaba Baba, the will of God. Rebeki Andabu Sandaba touches the Lord, I pray for revelation right now, God. Release destiny, God. Strengthen vision, God. Strengthen, Lord God, the, the willingness of your people to be obedient to the voice of God. Strengthen us, Lord. Let us be people who would see and hear your word and do the will of God. Let us set our will as flint, Lord God. Let us set our will as you've set your will to go to the cross and set us free. Let the will of man be aligned with the will of God. Bring fire and dominion, God. Help us, Lord, in all that we do. I believe you. Shanda barrebe kianda, the fullness of your glory released. The fullness of your kingdom released upon us. Shanda, we ask you, Lord God. Touch our nation, God. Touch our families. Bring revival that you have prophesied over our lives, Lord. We set our will. Shianda barubo kiendebe kianda farre kiando bo, Lord. I come before you, throne of grace. And all those men and women that have stepped in eternity and believed you, Lord God, activate their prayers. Activate their faithfulness upon this church and upon your kingdom and upon all that you have, Lord God. We ask you, we call out. Rebe ki ando bo si ki anda ba rebe ki ando bo robo si ki araba rebe ki ando bo si ki ende be ki ando bo robo si ki araba rabas ando bo robo bo. My child, I say to you, do not allow the flesh. Do not allow the disappointment of this life to weigh heavy upon your soul. For I've given you my son and truly your burdens can be cast onto him. He is willing to take the burden of your soul and to lead your soul into everlasting life. But in this life, there will be trouble. There will be tribulation and turmoil. And I say to you, take up my word. Take up the the promise that I've given to your life. Walk every day in a willingness to serve me and I'll meet you. And I'll give you the Shekinah glory that you desire. And I'll give you the fullness and the dominion that I've given to your forefathers before you. And I'll cause revival to be poured out upon this nation for it is in my will. But only those who seek it with their heart will find it. And only those that believe me will see it, for truly I am coming quickly and my sword is in my hand. And I say to my children, look up and step high in this life, for your redemption draws near.
just really feel that, you know, God wants us to know that he's, he's cheering for us to do his will. And those who have passed into eternity see us from the grandstand of heaven. And God's promises are good. And the prophecies that he's prophesied over our lives in times past, they, they, not one thing has fallen to the ground. We might not see it the way that we thought, but we're going to see what God wants us to do. And we're going to see all that he has for us as we stay faithful to the course, as we set our will. Listen, folks, there's going to be times in the last times before Jesus comes back where people are going to test our will. And we need to know that God has given us steel in our souls to stand and proclaim. Don't fear what they're going to do. Because God's bigger than that. I said to Roy, I said, what if your family doesn't want to hear what I've got to say, Roy? He smiled and said, Pastor, you'll tell them anyway. Because he goes, I've known you for three years and that's who you are. Listen to me. God has made you because of who you, because he's made you. He knows who you are. That's why you're here. That's why this end times, you've been called for such a time as this. And God's going to do what he said he's going to do for us. He's good for us. Amen. I want to give uh, Pastor Donna and, well, Pastor Donna, what am I saying? Pastor Din and Donna a, a scripture I really felt. God, um, want, want me to read you this scripture. I don't know all that it means. Ephesians 1 verse 3. He said to me that you made a commitment to each other and a commitment to him and he wanted me to read you this text. Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for in our union with Christ, he has blessed us by giving us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ when we're married to Christ so that we would be holy and without fault before him because of his love. God has already decided that through Jesus Christ, he would make us his children. This was his pleasure and his purpose. And so he said to me, he saw the commitments that you made to each other and you made to him. And he's good to it. He'll make it happen. Whatever that was. I want um, Pastor and Donna to come. I want all the men to come. We're going to lay hands on, it, on, on, on the Pastor and Donna. We're going to pray for them. Amen. Let's just pray for them. Just, let's just pray. Lord, we pray right now, your kingdom, your dominion, your power, your anointing, God, your word, the peace of God. Shando rebe kianamandanda. Rebetiando, we come against every strategy of hell and every heaviness, every lie. We break its power in Jesus' name. We agree together with the man of God. We stand in the breach, Lord God. We call upon heaven itself to come down. God, release your angels. Release the fullness of your kingdom and push the breach, Lord, as we push the battle to the gates of hell itself. Bring fire and strength, God. Release protection. Freedom. Plans. Strategies. For revival in Jesus' name. Bless you. Bless you, Pastor. Just God wanted me to tell you, you don't have to worry. Might not always look the way that it's going to look. He's going to come through in every single thing that you say. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Take service. Amen. Let's just stay where we are. We're just going to close in the word of prayer. Let's turn around and just ask God to help us. Amen. Could I just pray? And on behalf of the church here, Pastor Evangelist Corey Bourne, 
we, we love you, we appreciate you, we appreciate the ministry and the words uh, and, and all the preaching and the presence of God. And so uh, just, um, just be prepared also to just um, show your appreciation to Pastor and ask God to really uh, help you, amen, as well with what he's already done this week, amen. Let me just pray. Father, we just come before you, Lord God, as vessels to be filled by your Spirit. Vessels, oh God, willing to receive all that you have for this congregation, this church. We pray, Lord God, that every message that has gone through, Lord God, into our spirit, into our souls, that it would manifest to your glory. It will produce, Father, fruit and fruit of abundance, oh God, and fruit that will remain, God, for the rest of our lives, God, as we meet you in eternity, Lord God. We also want to pray, God, for Pastor Evangelist Corey Bourne, God, and his wife and his family. We pray, God, that your favor will be upon him. God, your anointing, God, would be continued to increase and, Father, flow, God, straight from the throne into his life. And may he, Lord, Father, glorify your name with everything that he does throughout his life. In Jesus' my name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Amen.